Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to our audience. Thank you for joining us for this lecture entitled The Internet of Things and Remote Medicine, part of our distinguished public lecture series delivered by the Aga Khan University in collaboration with the University of Central Asia and the CXO Global Forum. My name is Shokat Ali Khan, and I'm the CIO of the Aga Khan University. It is my privilege today to host Winton Sir, known as the father of the internet. Winton is vice president and chief internet evangelist for Google. Together with Robert Hahn, Wint co-designed the internet. For this achievement, he has received several awards, including the US National Medal of Technology in 1997, the Presidential Medal of Freedom in 2005, and the ASEAN Turning Award. In April, 2008, they shared the Japan Prize for their work, and in 2013, the Queen Elizabeth Prize for Engineering. Wint has been a visiting scientist as the Jet Propulsion Laboratory since 1998, and he holds 29 honorary degrees alongside his PhD in computer science. Despite all his commitments, this is not the first time Winton has participated with us in the series, and we are pleased to welcome him back. Today, Wint will share his perspective on the internet of things and remote medicine. The pandemic ha has accelerated trends within healthcare around innovative use of data, connectivity, and networks to provide greater access to practitioners and improve health outcomes for patients. The future is exciting. Wint will speak for around 30 minutes, after which our panel of technology leaders from Pakistan, Central Asia, Africa, and United Kingdom will ask questions. With those words, it's my honor to welcome Wint Sir. Alaikum salam, uh, Shaukat, and thank you so much for that very kind introduction. Uh, one thing that uh, I will say is that the pandemic, uh, which we are all experiencing, uh, has taught us a number of lessons, and I'm going to pick uh, three areas where I think we've uh, been learning lessons. One of them is that it, some people can work from home, but not everyone, because not everyone has access to the internet or has facilities at home that would permit this kind, or, or is doing work uh, that can be done remotely. For many people, proximity is important, and, and if you're a doctor, often proximity is an important part of, of your work, and we'll come back to that. The second thing is that uh, some kids have been able to go to school from home. Once again, if you, if you don't have access to the internet, then that doesn't work very well. And if you think a little bit about parents working at home and kids trying to go uh, to school while they're at home, there's always a kind of collision. You know, that, you know, do they have separate rooms? Is there enough bandwidth so that everyone can simultaneously uh, do this kind of video conferencing? And of course, the answer is often no. So we've learned that some of these things are possible, but we've also learned that there are barriers that get in the way of uh, successful uh, use of the internet in those ways. And this brings me to uh, remote medicine. Uh, my wife and I uh, uh, contracted COVID in March of 2020 while we were in London. So we brought it back to the US, although I think it may have already gotten there in advance of us. But uh, back then, um, no one had any good tests for this, and so it was very hard to even get verified. Um, and the doctors didn't want you in their offices. They said, we don't want you to come in because uh, we might get uh, COVID, and so please just call us on the phone or do a video call. And my recollection, my reaction to this request from the doctors was, wait a minute, what kind of medicine is this? Uh, you didn't take my temperature, or my pulse, and you know you haven't checked my heart rate, and uh, you know you can't really do a good job of diagnosing anything in this way. And they said yes, but we don't want to be infected, and we don't have adequate personal protection. So, so please stay away. And as I thought about that, uh, I realized that uh, if we were going to yield uh, uh, a successful remote medicine practice that we were going to have to get better information from the patients, even though they aren't necessarily in, in the office with us. 
And that, of course, leads to a variety of possible IoT devices that can act as sensors, providing important information for diagnostic purposes. Uh, and many of you, I'm sure, already have invested in uh, smart watches, for example, or Fitbits or other kinds of devices that will measure various and sundry uh, physiological uh, phenomena. And it's easy to imagine at some point that uh, everyone will have some small complement of devices for remote monitoring and re remote sensing uh, in order to have successful visits with the doctor, even though you're not in, in the doctor's presence. This raises a couple of other very interesting um, possibilities of improved healthcare. And the reason that this is, is so interesting is that if once you have these kinds of sensors, we can talk about continuous monitoring. And as I'm sure many of you might appreciate, uh, if you're a doctor, often the, you see your patients only when they're sick. And so you could get the impression that they're always sick because they never show up when they're healthy. Uh, but the continuous monitoring uh, actually gives you an opportunity to see what's the normal state of your patient when they're, uh, when they're not sick. And that might trigger indications of illness much earlier than you might otherwise uh, experience. That's good news because any kind of treatment that can be uh, introduced early in a disease is often better than waiting until it's uh, more, the symptoms are more severe. However, uh, if we start thinking about uh, this uh, class of IoT device, we start to worry about uh, a number of things that, or at least we should be worried about, because many of these devices are relatively inexpensive and the parties that make them are, are eager to uh, reduce their own costs. So how do they do that? Well, in addition to the actual design of the physical device and the sensors that go with it and so on, uh, one has to worry about the software that animates these devices. And it's very common to go to open source software, which is free, uh, and use that uh, to build the software that's associated with these IoT devices. And if you're like me and you have some uh, awareness of uh, cybersecurity, this should make you very nervous because the, the notion of open source, uh, which has wonderful benefits, uh, also leads to the belief uh, mistaken belief that because it's open source, everyone has seen the code and all the bugs have been found. The trouble is everyone thinks that and so nobody bothers to look and the result is that a lot of open source is full of all kinds of bugs. Now, why do we worry about that? Well, the first problem, of course, is that if there's bugs in the software, uh, it may not work uh, as intended and as advertised. Worse, uh, smart people uh, can find those bugs and then exploit them uh, to abuse the IoT device, either to make it function incorrectly, which would be bad, you might get wrong diagnoses with all kinds of terrible consequences, or the device might be used in order to get into the user's uh, local network, into your home network or Wi-Fi network, in order to get access to other devices with more uh, power in them, and then to exploit that uh, and to take advantage of denial of service attacks or penetration into some system, uh, maybe digging into your digital wallet uh, or any of a variety of, of other kinds of uh, mischief. Uh, sometimes uh, it can be extremely dangerous. And uh, just to um, uh, uh, use a, uh, a contemporary example, as many of you are well aware of the tensions uh, between Russia and the Ukraine right now. And there are reports that of cyber attacks going after infrastructure in Ukraine uh, that exploits these kinds of uh, bugs in the software. So for people who are making IoT devices, which are intended uh, for medical benefit, it seems to me that there is a big ethical responsibility to be more careful about the safety and security of those devices. Uh, than might otherwise be apparent. On top of that, of course, when we're talking about medical information, uh, privacy becomes a big issue. People don't want their medical conditions to be widely uh, advertised necessarily. And that means that these devices have to have the capacity to encrypt uh, information for protection. 
probably has to have the ability to do very strong authentication so that only parties that are authorized have access to the device and its controls and its content. So you can imagine uh, a significant list of uh, desirable properties of medical IoT devices, some of which I've just touched upon. Uh, I also want to uh, suggest to you that there are some uh, ancillary uh, challenges that uh, IoT and medical care introduce. Uh, this notion of remote medicine is extremely attractive, especially in areas where you don't have many medical practitioners available. So if there is internet infrastructure and, and suitable devices, uh, doctors can help patients who would otherwise not get adequate uh, diagnosis and treatment. Uh, however, in the United States, just to pick an example that I know something about, um, we have a set of rules about who is allowed to practice medicine. Uh, and uh, the determination that you are qualified to practice medicine is something that each state decides. So there are state exams for uh, qualifying for uh, medical practice, just as there are state exams to practice in the legal profession. Uh, and the consequence of that is the doctors who are qualified to serve patients in, in a particular state, uh, let's say Virginia, which is where I live, are not qualified uh, to serve patients in, say, California, unless they've also passed the exam in California. The insurance companies that pay for medical care uh, don't pay for or won't pay for remote medicine for a doctor that isn't qualified or certified to serve the patient in the state in which the patient happens to be. And as you start to emphasize the value and importance and possibility of remote medicine, now you have this this uh, legal quagmire that has to be resolved, and it has not been resolved here in the U.S., and perhaps uh, that problem arises elsewhere. So adjusting the medical care system to, uh, to support uh, remote medical care uh, may uh, require the attention of legislators and regulators in addition to everything else. Um, there's another um, I would say related uh, issue here that is slowly uh, becoming apparent. I'm sure everyone, of course, uh, hears artificial intelligence and machine learning tripping off the tongue. Uh, no matter where you go, something is doing something with machine learning. And it's very powerful. Uh, there's no question that we've seen some dramatic diagnostic capabilities arising from machine learning technology. But from uh, where I sit, uh, machine learning has both a powerful uh, potential, but it also is brittle in the sense that sometimes the uh, correlations uh, that are uh, the result of machine learning and training uh, are brittle and they get things wrong. Uh, a classic example of this is an image recognition system, uh, which has been trained to recognize uh, a variety of different objects, animals and other things in the physical environment. And so uh, you show this uh, system a picture of a cat and it says it's a cat and everybody applauds. And then uh, you change a few tiny pixels uh, in the image of the cat. Uh, and the system says, oh, it's a fire truck. And of course, everybody looks at that and says, how could this possibly, you know, how could this device come to this conclusion or machine learning tool come to that conclusion? And the answer is that the vision which is exercised by machine learning is very different from the way in which we perceive uh, things because we see um, features in a way that these machine learning systems don't. And the result is this occasional uh, brittleness. And uh, you can see obviously that if you were relying on a diagnosis by a machine learning system that uh, is brittle, then it may produce a very wrong diagnosis. And so you wouldn't want someone to be uh, declared uh, cancer free uh, when they aren't or cancerous uh, when they are actually free of cancer. So I would exercise considerable caution uh, in relying on machine learning mechanisms for diagnostic purposes without having some uh, additional examination of the results to, uh, to, in order to be um, convinced that the result is accurate. Uh, and the people who are working in machine learning do understand this and are working to find ways of exposing 
uh, potential uh, weaknesses uh, in the diagnostic procedures uh, in order to avoid a mistaken diagnosis. So these are, are some of the kinds of things that I worry about in the IoT space. Uh, they are uh, certainly cover more than just medical uh, instrumentation, uh, but they are uh, specifically and particularly of concern uh, on the possibility that uh, diagnoses might be in error. Uh, let me just move to uh, one other space in, of IoT uh, before we get into our discussions, which I am very much looking forward to. Uh, and that's uh, remote uh, surgery. Uh, there are some people who, you know, in, in the, you know, in science fiction stories, uh, have a person operating a robot remotely. And in fact, there have been a few demonstrations of that uh, you know, here in the U.S. and possibly elsewhere. Uh, the one I'm <clears throat> familiar with is the, the uh, intuitive surgical Da Vinci robot, which is a four-armed thing, which. Uh, uses uh, laparoscopic uh, kinds of, uh, of uh, treatment uh, in order to, min to, to uh, offer minimally invasive surgery. And you know, when someone asked me uh, whether I would consider being um, uh, operated on by such a device, uh, I said, yes, uh, but I would not want the operator to be remote on the internet uh, because that would be the moment when the internet he has a blip or a glitch or fails or something, just as the surgeon is about to cut something very important. And uh, I would not want to be on the other end of that little uh, network error. So my view is that the local uh, operation is very attractive, but maybe remote operation, not so much. Uh, there is, however, an adjunct uh, that we learned about at Google. Uh, some of you will remember the Google Glasses uh, that were developed that had a, a video monitor uh, and, of course, a display so that you could see sort of augmented reality. Uh, although that um, eventually, uh, that product eventually was, uh, was uh, ended, uh, we found that a lot of those devices ended up in operating rooms so that uh, doctors who were remote could see what the surgeon was seeing through the uh, Google Glass. And you can imagine you know, the remote surgeon uh, helping to guide the local surgeon uh, by saying, you know, watch out for this or don't cut that little yellow thing, that's important. Uh, so the idea of uh, having remote uh, advice as opposed to remote manipulation uh, strikes me as being a very reasonable uh, proposition. So I'm going to propose to stop at this point uh, and invite questions and discussion because my colleagues who are on this call and who are part of the panel I'm, are sure to have important ideas that will uh, relate to uh, this topic. And I'm sure that I have failed miserably to cover the waterfront of importance here. So I'm eager for my colleagues to comment, react, and, and question. Uh, so, uh, I, Shalkat, I turn this back over to you as moderator uh, and uh, to take us into the remainder of our discussion. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Renton. Thank you so much uh, for sharing your perspective on this highly relevant and increasingly important area of work. We will now open the questions. I will just introduce you with, uh, with our, our leaders who are in this panel, and then I will request them to uh, ask the questions. So, uh, the first question I, I would like to um, invite uh, Dastan Dugoy, who is the former Deputy Prime Minister of Kyrgyz Republic and Minister of IT. And he's an amazing technology leader, a young technology leader in Central Asia, uh, has done his uh, the education from Howard and then the leading from the front, actually. So, uh, Dastan, you're welcome to ask your first question. Thank you, Shafkat. So, first of all, Mr. Surf, thank you very much for the enlightening, I would say, speech. Um, I mean, the, the, the topic of IoT has always been interesting because we can see all the benefits that we get out of this in, in our day-to-day -day business. But I mean, uh, being, let's say, uh, I've been working for the government for the last 10 years. And uh, I think the serious issue is would be the lack of regulation that you mentioned in your speech today. And, uh, but at the same time, I think how we can motivate the industry to innovate new ways, how to protect IoT and ensure the privacy. 
of of like different kinds of users. So what would you, what do you think would be the effective measures to motivate the industry to come up with that kind of innovative ways to protect the IoT technologies? So this is a Thank very you. good, uh, very practical question uh, to ask. Here in the U.S., some time ago, uh, we passed laws that require the protection of uh, medical information. It's called HIPAA. Uh, and it's a rather convoluted uh, piece of legislation, to be quite honest. On the other hand, it has cr created substantial motivation for uh, the medical care industry, including people who make IoT devices, to pay attention to uh, the mechanics of protecting access to uh, medical information. The implication of, of, of that protection is threefold, I would say. First of all, uh, one needs to have the ability to strongly authenticate the authority of a person to have access to that medical information. Uh, second, in order to protect it at all, uh, in all instances, it, cryptography is important so that if someone breaks into a, a, a storage system, uh, they may not be able to extract useful data because it's encrypted and it might be take more effort than it's worth to try to decrypt it. Uh, I do think, uh, however, that, uh, that there is a, a scenario that you might agree uh, is, uh, is compelling. Let us imagine that you are in a city you've never been in before and you fall severely ill you're in the emergency room. At that point, the, you want every doctor who's treating you to have access to all the medical records available about you so that they can uh, save you. Uh, and assuming you survive, however, uh, the last thing you want is that because they had access to your medical records while you were in crisis, uh, you don't want them to have continued access to it. And so there is this idea of having episodic authority, which can be revoked uh, in order to protect your privacy after the uh, emergency is over. And so these are the kinds of, of things that are non-trivial to work through. Uh, and uh, in terms of uh, motivation, again, I have to say that uh, all of these things uh, introduce additional cost. And so the uh, natural reaction of most commercial operations is how do I reduce cost and increase margin? And the only way that, uh, that we can uh, counterbalance that, I think, is to have uh, legal frameworks that require people to pay attention to uh, the privacy and, and, the, and the accuracy uh, and integrity of the uh, medical data. One of my colleagues has frequently said he didn't care about his privacy as much as he cared about the integrity of the data. He didn't want somebody to go in and change his blood type because if he had a transfusion later, he might die because the wrong kind of blood was used. And he, so his, the integrity of the record was even more important to him than its, uh, than its confidentiality. So I think you're right to raise these issues. And I think legislation may be the primary uh, mechanism by which to motivate uh, attention to this problem. Thank you. Thank you very much, Vint, uh, and thank you, uh, Dustin. We will come back. Uh, we have a lot of questions. I, I, I just uh, need to rush up. Our uh, next question is from uh, Colonel Imran, who is the Sector Commander of Special Communication Organization. And when, just for your information, the Special uh, Communication Organization is the only organization in the north part of Pakistan in the mountains who delivers internet services, actually, and, in, and he's heading that uh, organization. So, Colonel Imran, you're welcome to ask. Uh, good evening, uh, sir. Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank you and uh, for your uh, very enlightened talk on the subject. My uh, question or my comment, uh, it is a mixed sort of question plus comment because I'm serving or I'm trying to serve the uh, far-flung area of Gilgit Baltistan where the basic necessities of lives are not available. What to talk of internet even at places where people don't have the electricity around the clock especially in winter season. So uh, there are two things. One is, uh, as you have commented, that uh, you would not like to be operated remotely. So in Gilgit Baltistan, once they are not specialist available, and we have to op go for this option that uh, one has to be operated remotely, then what all precautions should be there? Because this is very important that uh, human life is at stake. 
so if the disconnectivity of the internet or whatsoever it is if it is robot or something mechanical instrument which has been used through internet if it goes off so one thing is what do you recommend in this scenario and another my comment on the subject that all the panelists uh, elite panelists can just uh, if anyone can uh, think on it that should we go to train our paramedic staff to operate for the minor surgeries and they can be guided remotely through internet so that's a very comprehensive question. Um, I, you know, the thing which I find um, disturbing, I guess, is that we have not succeeded in making internet readily available and reliably available uh, more broadly. Uh, at the moment, perhaps as much as 60% of the world has access, but as you must know, in every part of the world, rural parts of, of the countries are uh, poorly served, uh, if at all, uh, in many cases. Uh, and uh, you're also right to point out that none of this works without electricity. And so reliable electrical power is uh, a major component of, uh, of success here. The one thing which does give me um, uh, considerable comfort uh, is that the low earth orbiting satellite efforts uh, that you see with Starlink and some of the others uh, that are uh, a little bit behind um, may actually provide adequate access to almost any place in the world. And uh, now there's an issue about how much does it cost and is it affordable? And that's a very important question. Uh, but that may turn out to, uh, to solve at least a lot of the rural uh, connectivity problem. The other thing I have been surprised to see is the amount of investment in undersea cable uh, in order to bind a lot of the continents together uh, in the uh, global internet. Uh, it's been surprising to see how much more subsea cable capacity is being built on an annual basis in order to uh, provide full global connectivity. But I think that we still have a long ways to go uh, to drive costs out and to increase um, reliable access uh, to these technologies because in their absence it's not clear how we can uh, serve people in a remote way as as you uh, suggest if the other panelists have you know views on this i, I hope uh shout out that will allow them to express themselves as well yes uh, sure uh, i think um, we can take a couple of uh, questions and then maybe if any panelists want to uh, respond on any other question, then if you can just raise your hand, then I can uh, I will be able to see that you do. So next one, I will I will request uh, Sidra Iqbal uh, with us. She's an award-winning uh, broadcast journalist at one of the leading uh, channels in Pakistan, uh, in and a very famous uh, personality with regards to uh, technology and also public speaking. So I would ask her to to ask her question. Thank you so much, Shakat, for that very kind and generous in introduction. And thank you, Mr. Surf. I, I really enjoyed the comments. And I find comfort in the fact that a lot of our, our concerns are sort of resonated around the globe. You're absolutely spot on when you talk about the integrity and the safety of data. But I was wondering, uh, you know, whenever I've seen, um, you know, people go through an episode, which is a health-related risk, um, they always speak about timely intervention. I think this has been brought in focus thanks to the pandemic as well. But I wonder, just like social media has made us all, you know, a little too tired, and we've been talking about disconnecting to connect, I'm wondering if I'm constantly being monitored, and that too for my health, for my vitals, wouldn't that cause alert fatigue? I mean, just the intent, even if the data is very secure and it's very credible, just continuing to monitor, wouldn't that drive us up the walls? I mean, what's your take on the alert for me? <laughs> well, so actually, let me let me give you a counter example. Uh, I don't know if you are, are a person who focuses on exercise and the like, but there are people who are quite, you know, focused on this and they insist on having their exercise every day, or they want to know, you know, just in the normal course of the day, how many steps did I take? And do people even compete with each other? I took 9,622 steps today. How did you do? Um, and so there is, uh, a, a, I think, an increasing um, appreciation for this notion of continuous monitoring. Now let's distinguish 
between somebody else looking at the results all the time, which I think would make you feel like you were under a microscope. And I would agree that there's a sort of a, my God, everybody is watching everything that my body is doing. However, let's suppose that we can find uh, the data collection locally. Let's imagine uh, that we have machine learning tools that allow us to evaluate that data locally. And by the way, there's a considerable amount of research going on now to do edge, what's called edge machine learning, which put, confine the machine learning to the device itself so that the data never has to go away. Unless, of course, it detects something and, and, and needs to signal or wants to signal or you want it to signal the doctor to say, you should look at this. This is an, you know, an unexpected arrhythmia uh, uh, and here's what the trace looks like and uh, you know, what do you think? Uh, and you would want that. Uh, you would want anomalies to be reported to a trusted party uh, if, in fact, it might make a big difference to your health and safety, uh, particularly if it's an indicator of something that might even be fatal. So I think uh, there are, people are not so much um, resistant to continuous monitoring if it's local as much as they might be if it's continuous and external. Uh, and I'm convinced now that we have more than enough horsepower. I mean, think of the devices that, that people carry around since 2007. Uh, mobile phones have become, they're not phones anymore. I mean, they're you know, supercomputers for all practical purposes. Uh, and they have a lot of local capability. So my guess is that, uh, that we will become quite comfortable with the idea that uh, we're getting attention from our local devices to warn us uh, and maybe even allow us to decide. On the other hand, you know, if you think uh, you might want somebody to know about that. Mm -hmm. But wouldn't you want tears of that? I mean, somebody who's critically ill and more likely to get uh, a life-threatening anomaly, wouldn't they be under such close supervision? Like around the world, already 3 million people are connected to IoT devices, which are continually monitoring them. About 600,000 of these are the pacemakers, the most commonly monitored thing, but there's a condition that qualifies you for that. Aren't we opening it up to healthy, mindful people and getting them to be sort of stressed about how many steps they took, how many calories they take, did take up, and what's happening with their vitals and their blood nutrients? I mean, that, that's a scary picture for me. Well, it, you know, the, you could imagine a kind of a feedback loop uh, where it, it becomes almost OCD-like. Uh, on the other hand, uh, if you think about people who are uh, medically threatened, that continuous monitoring may actually be absolutely essential. And I would, I would want that. I mean, if, if I thought that there were conditions uh, that, uh, that might uh, occur that could be detected by remote monitoring, uh, and 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 I and I could be saved uh, by the by the uh, response. Then why wouldn't I want that? And by the way, there is one other thing I would observe, and that's the ability to do remote monitoring and allow you to move around and and you know in your normal day, as opposed to being confined to a bed and all wired up. Yes. And so yes. these technologies are technologies of freedom in some sense compared to the practices of the past where you couldn't go anywhere, you were literally stuck in bed. So in some ways, uh, I would say there's a positive side of this too. I absolutely agree. Thank you so much thank for you. that, Mr. Sir. Thank you. Thank you, and thank you, Sister. I just want to recognize the Honorable Minister for uh, New Technologies and Industries from the Republic of Tajikistan. He's, he's here and, and listening, and he has uh, sent me a couple of questions, which I will, I will ask you afterwards. And now I would like to invite uh, um, Dr. Nadim, Khaja Nadim Ahmed. He's our Chief Medical Information Officer, one of the global leaders in the health tech industry, actually, and has been working in North America and all over the world. Now, now he's with the Lake uh, University. Yes, Dr. Nadim. Thank you, uh, Shafif. And uh, it is truly an honor to meet you, uh, Mr. Serp. So certainly appreciate you giving us your insights and sharing with us your thoughts when it comes to the internet of things and how it relates to healthcare and being provided to patients around the globe. Uh, certainly, you know, we're, we're witnessing much of that now, uh, the remote monitoring, the, uh, the devices that individuals have on them and such things are readily available in the West. And I know in the 
other developing parts of the world. The challenge is not so much the devices. Any one of us can probably purchase these devices online, even in the developing worlds. The problem I see is infrastructure. So mm -hmm. when you were designing the architecture for internet, uh, currently we know that the private industry owns the internet. Um, I mean, look, the bottom line is uh, I have to pay a company to access that road. And if I look at internet as infrastructure, uh, what are your views about having infrastructure for the common person? In other words, this should maybe a uh, government uh, provided facility for their common citizens, that this is infrastructure, just like a road. When a, when a community complains, we, don't, we can't connect to the other uh, uh, location in our own country. The government provides that road. Should the government also provide internet infrastructure so that these devices actually have meaning and we can do these things? And is Google promoting such um, um, efforts? Uh, it, certainly in, in the US, I know there's a lot of conversation about this, but um, if it turns out that I personally have to pay for the you know, uh, internet through the sky or wherever, then it might not be possible. So I just wanted to hear your thoughts on that. Thank you so much. Well, first of all, at least here in the US, uh, it is provided in many cases, libraries, for example, and the schools have discounts and so on. Uh, and, but you know, in the end, you know, the costs all have to be paid for somehow. And, and I accept your argument that it doesn't necessarily have to come out of an individual's pocket. There may be a variety of ways of uh, helping to uh, afford uh, access to the internet, where, whether it's a subsidy or it's a, a provided as a public service as it is in our libraries, for example. Now, having said that though, uh, let me give you an example of various kinds of business models that uh, are have a mix of uh, private sector and maybe even public sector uh, cooperation. Uh, in uh, Kampala, Uganda, uh, Google built a fiber network for the city and it did this uh, as, a, as a business. It, it was a collaboration with uh, some other local companies. And then they offered that uh, citywide network service at wholesale rates to retailers who then competed with each other for business from customers. Now, this is the model where the customer pays. But again, uh, I would say that there are plenty of opportunities for governments to either provide the service directly uh, or to subsidize costs, or perhaps for the government to build infrastructure and, uh, and then support that and then let the retailers uh, use that in order to provide add-on you know, additional services. Uh, so I, here, here I think that we should be uh, creative in our models of how all the costs get paid. Uh, but you and I both uh, would agree that driving cost out uh, is a very important uh, motivation. This is also true for the private sector. Driving cost out is important to the private sector if they're trying to build margins. Uh, and of course, if you drive cost out, then uh, the total cost to the customer could come down. So I think there are a variety of ways uh, to um, approach the affordability question. Uh, but the one thing, the bottom line here is that uh, there is no free lunch in the sense that somehow if there is cost, it does have to be paid for somehow. And in the case of Google, for example, it is a very interesting arrangement where the consumers get free services in exchange for looking at ads that other people pay us to show them. And so that way the consumer doesn't have to pay except in time, uh, and that works. Uh, has worked very well, actually. So uh, I agree with you that we should be conscious of that problem, and I'm sure that we can come with a come up with a variety of ways of keeping things affordable. Uh, thanks so much for that uh, response. Ultimately, I I say this because um, that is a big challenge. Uh, you know, we're talking about robotics and providing remote monitoring in, in parts where the common response might be, well, they don't have broadband or they don't have internet, um, or the person might not even have a smartphone. So uh, right off the bat, it becomes quite challenging. However, um, if we promote the concept of governments or uh, uh, even if it's a local government providing it as a service, just like they're building a road, then of course, then you get into the situation of, well, they'll charge, charge a tax. Maybe there'll be an internet tax. 
So to, to help fund uh, the expense, and then it, that's a whole nother ball game. So uh, interesting dynamics and certainly want to personally say thank you for uh, bringing the industry to where we are. Uh, we wouldn't be having this call if it wasn't uh, without uh, the contributions that you have made. So thank you for that. Well, it, uh, Shaf, if you'll permit me a response uh, to this last observation. Sure, sure. First, the first thing I would say is that the private sector uh, has invested heavily uh, in building internet facilities, and, and we should give credit to the private sector for that. Uh, the second thing is that when Bob Kahn and I were designing the internet, although it was originally intended for Defense Department you know, command and control, uh, as we thought about it, we decided that we would not dictate anything about the business models that would be used for each of the various component networks of the internet. We didn't care. It could be run by the government. It could be a private sector thing. It could be a, any of a variety of choices of paying for the cost of operating that network. And we didn't care as long as the cost got paid. So I think you're, you're still in a good space in the sense that uh, anything that works uh, is okay as long as all the costs get paid. And so that doesn't stop a government from deciding to do exactly as you suggest. And in some governments, that's exactly what's happened. Uh, another example in the Kampala case, uh, the government could have decided to build that infrastructure and then make it available to the private sector for, uh, for resale. So uh, let's, put a, let's put our creative thinking hats on and find different ways of uh, recovering costs so that everyone has useful access to the internet. Great. Thank, you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Nadim. Uh, uh, next question I, I, I would take from uh, Azar Nawaz. Azar Nawaz is the group CIO at Angro, which is one of the biggest company in Pakistan. Azar is also a, a national leader in technology, uh, worked in the Pakistan International Airline also as a CIO and many other companies. Uh, so Azar, you're welcome to ask your question. Thank you, Shokat. Uh, hi, Vinton. And uh, first of all, I would like to uh, thank you, Shokat, and, uh, and other panelists. Uh, thanks for inviting me here. Uh, I would like to make a couple of points here. So uh, I, what I believe is that uh, uh, technology is here, IoT is here, you can't stop it, you need to, uh, th this will be used. So I think what we need to do is look to find ways around it and make sure that uh, we put governance and put frameworks around it and make sure that uh, the concerns which we have around privacy, in, around integrity, uh, around security, we, we do something to, you know, uh, give confidence to people around that. So, so I so the thing which I uh, have in mind is that uh, cannot the sector come together and develop some sort of framework, not only legal framework, but around also a, a technical framework, mm -hmm. so that a pl platform can be put together where people can use it with trust and stuff, and also uh, with your background. Can not an architecture be developed where you know you can you can uh, develop a platform where where you know people can trust all of this and and we can we can bring more and more people to to start using these services uh, quickly. That's an extremely well expressed challenge. So thank you for that. And and you and I share uh, I think a, a very common desire that we design, build, and operate systems that people can legitimately trust. Uh, now, ironically, at Google, uh, we came to the conclusion that a, a kind of distrust was the, a good basis for building the rest of the system. And so uh, we call this zero trust architectures. And so we assume, for example, that all networks have been compromised, including our own. And if you start from that assumption, then you start building additional mechanisms at higher layers in the architecture that defend against what would otherwise be an untrusted network. Uh, and of course, you can imagine that cryptography is a very important part of this, partly simply for confidentiality, but also for strong authentication. And here I could not overemphasize the importance of strong authentication to build trust. Uh, I make heavy use of two-factor authentication whenever I can. Uh, although I must tell you, if we go down a little alley for a second, 
I have about 300 accounts scattered around on the internet, some of them, of course, at Google, but others uh, elsewhere. And uh, for the ones that, that use two-factor authentication, we have these small little devices that plug into uh, the laptop and that perform a very high grade of, of cryptographic authentication. Uh, can you imagine having 300 of those little devices and fumbling around trying to figure out which one you're supposed to use for the account that you want to go to? So plainly, there's room for devices that you know hold large numbers of keys so that you can automatically select the appropriate one for the service that you're going to. Uh, so I don't mean to trivialize uh, how difficult it is to scale up uh, two-factor authentication, but it's a very important component. It's not the only one, but a very important one. Uh, the second thing I would say is that uh, we should infuse, not confuse, but infuse uh, our um, software industry uh, with a sense of responsibility to protect the users of their software. And that means paying a lot of attention to mistakes and fixing them, finding ways of updating software safely and securely. And when we're talking about IoT, which is one of the primary themes of this discussion, it's vitally important that a software-based IoT device have the ability to be updated with new software in order to repair bugs. But it also needs to be the case that the device can confirm it's getting the software from the right source, as opposed to a hacker, and that this, the software that they've received still has integrity and it hasn't been modified on its journey. So we're back to digital signatures, for example, as a very important component. So I would encourage you to continue to argue for and advocate uh, for these kinds of um, architectural steps and technological steps, and to insist that, uh, that those be required uh, of companies that are making uh, software that we're all depending on. So I think um, you have touched upon very two very important points. So one is around how the software is being developed. So we once once we develop a software, I think there's a lot of focus on on to look at and test the functional needs and see how the performance is and and all those things. While I think the first few things you need to look at is has has the proper governance being followed while developing a software. Are there any loopholes? And stuff. So, so I think that is very important. That's where, where we should start from. And uh, you mentioned very important uh, uh, um, uh, another important point, which is around 2FA. So, for example, I I have uh, an application which I use to uh, to get a code for a lot of my 2FA applications. So, so maybe you can rather if you have 300 accounts, you can have a central app where you can register all of them. And whenever you want to go, you can get a, get an authentication from that app and can use the login. So you know, two FA is, is is a very important part of, of of security. But how the applications are developed is, I think, the key area. We need to look at that. How the applications are developed? Do we follow proper governance around it, and do we lo do we leave any loopholes in in there? So uh, just uh, to continue on this theme uh, and to highlight uh, an important research topic for any of you who have graduate students who are wondering you know, what topic to pick, one of the toughest problems that I can think of is uh, developing a software environment that helps us expose mistakes before they get out into the software and they're propagated into the world. And I don't know about you, but I used to make a living writing software. And I have a little dent in my forehead from the many times when I've gone, oh, how could I make such a stupid mistake? Because often these bugs are just the result of uh, just dumb, dumb mistakes that show up. So uh, I, I would say getting better software development tools would be a very important thing to incorporate into uh, the framework that you're suggesting. And that's going to take some serious research. So something like I just I'll just finish in, in, in a minute just by making a comment, like something like automated testing, something like where you put certain governance processes where I have made a software and then there, there's a quality check, there's a security check before it's released. So things like that. Yeah, absolutely true. And, and you know, 
here in the US, the federal government uh, puts requirements on providers of service called FISMA, which is the federal information uh, security standards. And we all have to run through a series of major tests in order to demonstrate that we have uh, met those standards. So uh, we're in sync about that. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Winton. Thank you, Bazar. Uh, one of the prerequisites for internet is electricity. And uh, actually, we have the group CIO of the biggest electric company in, in Karachi, K Electric. Uh, so I would like to invite uh, Faisal Nehru because all the internet depends on if K Electric is giving us the internet in the city. So, and then he is the technology leader of, uh, of K Electric, in addition to, of course, he's one of the top leaders in our country as well. Faisal. Thank you, Shokat, and uh, thank you, Winton, for giving us this uh, time and, and uh, giving us a lovely uh, overview of, of, of the internet thing. Um, so my question is, uh, when it comes to IoT, uh, where do you think is the industry heading in the next, say, for example, five or 10 years? Uh, you mentioned about the edge devices becoming more intelligent, more powerful, so that's one thing. Uh, what else do you think is there on the horizon? Uh, and who do you think are the key players uh, when it comes to driving the innovation within the IoT domain? Uh, and this question has another uh, side threat to it, and that is that uh, there is this case of these big technology companies uh, driving the innovation. And what happens is normally if there are small companies who do come up with innovative solutions, uh, they end up being acquired uh, or uh, by these big firms. And this is something which I'm sure Google must be facing a lot of these problems, both in the in the West, in US and in UK. So who do you think are the key players and how are the big companies facilitating this innovation? How are they encouraging the small players? Because when you have more than uh, big players, small players also in the game, the innovation is faster, better, and chances of coming up with new ideas is also higher. So just if you could just elaborate on where the IoT industry is heading and how, uh, how the big players are contributing and who are going to be the major players in this domain? You know, this this question reminds me of the, of the one that says, describe the universe in 25 words or less and give three examples. Um, so first of all, uh, you and I are, uh, I think would agree that uh, the devices will become increasingly powerful simply because of the availability of uh, new computing technologies, including, for example, our TensorFlow, uh, capability, we're starting to uh, integrate that into edge devices uh, to give them more machine learning capability that can be confined to uh, the device itself. Uh, the, so more horsepower, more memory, and so on. Uh, I would say also we will see an increasing uh, collection of sensors showing up on mobiles, uh, as an example. The third thing is proliferation of wearable devices is also well underway. We can see that happening. Uh, one thing I would say in the IoT space is that um, as we build uh, small and inexpensive IoT devices, we may need to shield them uh, from potential attack. And so I can imagine that if you had an ecosystem full of IoT devices at home, let's say, which is increasingly the case. I mean, the, the, we did a little poll at Google to see how many internet enabled devices did everybody have? And some people had 40 or 50 of them now. Um, and I even found some, I did a little <clears throat> Wi-Fi check around the house and discovered some devices in a sock drawer that I'd forgotten about that the battery was still running. So uh, edge devices to protect the rest of them might also become a normal practice. Now, in the IoT world, uh, we're starting to see uh, makers of IoT devices try to create ecosystems so that all those devices interoperate with each other in a, in a, a smooth way, so that they all become part of a common uh, ecosystem. And I think at least some of the uh, larger uh, makers of these devices are beginning to realize that the consumers are going to expect interoperability across brands not simply interoperability within brand. And for those companies who recognize that, standards have become a very important uh, area of uh, both research and development. I believe that just like the TCP IP protocols were chosen in, in lieu of proprietary standards like SNA or DECnet or, or other uh, proprietary networking uh, technology, 
I think that consumers are going to force the makers of these devices to show interoperability, which requires standardization. So uh, that's what I expect to see unfold over time. And I think uh, the, uh, the driving force behind this uh, will be at least the consumers. There may even be driving forces to require interoperability uh, from the regulatory point of view in order to allow uh, the smaller companies to make things that are compatible with that ecosystem so that they don't have to be bought up by a big company in order to have a reasonable business. As long as they meet the common standards there and their devices interwork, uh, then uh, they may be able to build a market without uh, having to rely on uh, being part of a larger company. Uh, thank so thank you very much, uh, Shoka. Just a small comment. So you mentioned about the the protocols, just like TCP/IP or UDP. Is there something in the pipeline uh, that uh, companies are working on and coming over the yes. universal protocol? There's an organization. Uh, it may be just U.S. based. I, I confess I'm not certain. It's called IoTX, uh, and it's a collection of people who make IoT devices and are very interested in making things interwork. And I, you know, I can say that uh, within Google, there's a strong recognition that within brand, the ecosystem is very important. Uh, but there's a growing appreciation that consumers are going to insist on everything interworking successfully. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, actually, we have a lot of questions, and I know that your time is reduced, so I will just uh, go fast for the next five minutes. Uh, I would like to ask uh, Farhana Narakia, uh, who is currently in, in Nairobi, based in, in Canada. She's our uh, Chief Data Innovation Officer. Uh, Farhana? Thanks. Um, so that was an excellent conversation, Vinton. And you, know, you highlighted very astutely that the pandemic, too, has accelerated digital transformation. And so, you know, prior you had data being collected in many sources, but now with the pandemic, you know, you've got data coming in from multiple sources. You've already had quite a few conversations and questions around the infrastructure and the security. And, you know, I align with your thoughts with respect to, we do need to sort of look at global standards and making sure that they are um, adherence to that. With AKU operating primarily in LMIC settings, low middle income settings, um, you know, what we look to is to leverage data in a manner to bring innovative solutions, to bring care pathways to the communities we serve. But the question I have is with this proliferation of data, one of the concerns that I would have is around an ethical framework. So we've talked about it from a security perspective, we've talked about it from an uh, infrastructure perspective, but what about the ethical component? You know, the data getting into the wrong hands and then being, um, you know, uh, compromised and uh, against potentially marginalized communities. And this can happen both in the wet, in the high income countries and low middle income countries. What are your thoughts on that? Well, I think you're spot on to be concerned about ethics. And in my sense right now is that in schools where we are teaching people how to program, we should include uh, a significant dose of ethical software development uh, and also ethical use of data uh, and, and a sense of obligation to protect people's information. Uh, there are uh, efforts underway to, to uh, that are uh, touted as giving you control over your own information. Uh, I, I am a little skeptical about some of these because it, it, there is a natural online pace of life these days where information about your transactions simply ac accumulate. And you know, if you're uh, doing online banking, the bank has a lot of information about your uh, transactions, or if you are using a brokerage house, they have a lot of information about your investments. And they actually need that information in order to provide the service that you want, and you want them to have that information. So the, the real question, I think, in, implicit uh, is in your question, uh, is whether the people who uh, write the software and use the software uh, recognize this ethical responsibility they have. Now, in the past, um, that hasn't been enough to, uh, to induce the behavior that we want. And so to give you a simple example of uh, how this can work, uh, in, the, in the US, uh, cars used to have no seatbelts. 
and uh, we used to show people, you know, why it was important to uh, to have a seatbelt in order to protect yourself in the case of a collision. But even though we showed all these horrible pictures to teenagers and everything else, you know, even if the car had seatbelts, they didn't put them on. So uh, we said to the car manufacturers, okay, you are not selling another car in this country unless it has seatbelts. Okay, so that's step one. Step two, if we catch you driving without the seatbelt on, there will be consequences. And so it may very well be that we have to invent consequences in order to induce the ethical behavior that you're suggesting and you and I both agree is important. I think that, um, you know, you. I'm just gonna make one comment, Shoka. I think your points are very valid and it's balanced. And what I'm really hoping is that large organizations like yourself push for this because otherwise, you know, we could potentially have, you know, some of the scandals that have come out, you know, for example, why the Facebook algorithm in terms of pushing information, you know, we know we're aware of these. I hope we can get ahead of it, be proactive versus us being retroactive. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. I mean, uh, I know that it's six o'clock now. Uh, do you have two, five more minutes or we should stop here? If there are uh, actually, I'm, I'm, I have time, so I'm happy to keep going for a little bit. Excellent. Uh, so my, my, uh, I, I will invite uh, Alia Begum, and the CEO. she is the Operations Director, Action Village Community, uh, uh, an honor in the healthcare industry and, in a, and a very, very talented uh, professional. So, so Alia. Thank you very much. And um, what a fantastic discussion, Vincent. I'm I'm buzzing with thoughts and ideas and questions, but let me let me try and be coherent in, in, in a specific question for you. So thank you again for your time and for inviting me to, to ask a question. So I mean, linking to the previous um to the previous question around behaviors and and maybe even thinking about nudging towards a certain type of behavior amongst these companies, um we can see that in other areas of big tech, private organizations are leading the way um, with innovation and funding and, and the regulation, legislation, standards and policy tend to sort of lag behind or play catch up in, in many ways. Um, you know, the, the previous person spoke about the social media. Also, we see this in space exploration. And I guess my question to you is when we think about healthcare, which is a much more highly regulated environment in many parts of the world, um, with much more significant consequences where that regulation fails or isn't applied correctly. Um, what can we learn from these other scenarios? Um, because for me, it's it's about balancing the need for the alignment of, across stake stakeholder groups, but it's also about not cycling innovation, and particularly in healthcare, not delaying patients from benefiting from accessing healthcare and healthcare services. So I guess from your perspective, what can we learn from these other scenarios that we can apply in healthcare? Well, possibly the most important lesson might be that uh, the privacy of healthcare uh, or health information should not enter, I, mean, I want to say this carefully, uh, we want to be able to harvest the value of aggregate healthcare information so that we can understand, for example, the arrival of a pandemic or some condition that uh, we might not otherwise uh, recognize. Now, at Google, uh, we had one experiment where we were trying to figure out if we could see whether uh, a flu uh, season peak uh, was arriving by looking at who, uh, not, not individuals, but just how many people were looking up certain symptoms but you know what does it mean if i'm you know coughing three times a day or 30 times an hour uh, and so we actually were trying to predict you know where the peaks were and our results were mixed and uh, but then of course there's the official things coming from the center for disease control and we discovered by blending the data together we actually got very accurate information about you know when were we hitting peaks in flu season so the idea of being able to get access to and make use of aggregate information seems to me really important and valuable. And I would hope that our, in our zeal to protect people's privacy, we don't deny ourselves the possibility of understanding the health of our populations. And as you think about government policymaking in the healthcare uh, uh, in the area, uh, it's really important to know how healthy or unhealthy is my population. Mm -hmm. And so we really need to be able to accumulate that data. And I would also suggest to you that uh, the ability to preserve that information over a period of time is equally important because the time series tells us something about the attack, for example, uh, of a particular uh, virus like the one we're living in right now. 
And so having the data over time is also very, very valuable. So our, our challenge, I think, is to protect people's uh, individual privacy, but still making the aggregate information useful and available uh, for policymaking. Absolutely. That feels like a really solid balance. Um, thank you. Thank you for that insight, Vinton. Thank you. Thank you, Alia, and thank you, Vint. Uh, I think Isidra would like to comment here. Thank you so much, uh, Shokat. Uh, Mr. Sir, I was listening to the comments regarding uh, to ethics, but somehow the impression I'm getting, we're always sort of wary of, uh, of the threats from malware, from potential hackers, or people who can corrupt the integrity of this data. But how do we keep a check? Again, it dials back to the ethics of the business enterprises who will be, will be sort of investing in this innovation. How do we sort of keep a check on their profiteering? What is the advice that they're pushing out in terms of healthcare? What treatments are needed? What medicines are needed? Are somehow tilted towards making more profit while they are still you know, working towards making the nation or the people healthier? What if they are, they're kind of pushing their own products or their own treatments? How do we sort of gauge our way through that? So uh, this is a really complicated question because we see this sort of problem uh, here in the US and perhaps others of you in other parts of the world where the pharmaceutical companies uh, try to encourage the doctors to prescribe their particular drugs. And it, uh, it's even worse on American television now for the, over the past maybe two decades. Uh, it, we never used to see drugs being advertised on television. And here in the States, we actually see this you know, Somebody says, there's this new drug and it will make your life wonderful and you should go to the doctor and ask if you can have some. Uh, I'm, uh, I'm personally kind of offended by that, uh, and, uh, but it hasn't, you know, it, it, it exists. So that hasn't been suppressed. Uh, maybe it's people like you that can help us uh, remember that, uh, that we should be attentive to these questions uh, it may be the only thing we can do is to keep reminding people that you should watch out for the following bad side effects of certain behaviors and practices. Don't fall, uh, you know, uh, prey to them, which does bring up one thing, which is maybe tangential, but it's associated with your question. How do we teach people from an early age to be safe in the online environment? How do we help them understand what the risk factors are? Now, we implicitly talk to them. I mean, the classic example, you tell your kid, don't run out into the street, look both ways. Well, we need to have similar instructions for the online environment. People have to appreciate that there are risks out there and they have to understand how to protect themselves and they have to have tools to protect themselves. Uh, and so it's our job, I think, uh, as adults, to make sure that, that children learn about these things because that's an, a world they're going to live in. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and so you can help with that. And you know, from your, from your, in your professional responsibility, you can keep reminding us that we should be paying attention to things like that. Very true. Thank you for that comment, Mr. Sir. But I think it's not just the children, it's also the adults. I mean, yeah. Oh, yeah. In Afghanistan, yeah happen to be the only two countries where we haven't eradicated polio. And we see like, despite, um, you know, communication plans, the entire government machinery, the private machinery being very active in that, there are gaps, there are major gaps and people are still resistant. But thank you so much for those comments. Well, just uh, to, uh, if Shokat, if you don't mind a rejoinder on this, uh, we suffer from this problem here in the US. There is a substantial amount of misinformation that's flying around about COVID and the vaccinations and all this. And that turns out to be really hard to counter. And uh, Shokat, if you'll permit me, I want to give a little anecdote that explains why this is so hard. I want you to imagine for just a moment uh, that, um, uh, let's say uh, Shalkat has uh, come to me, I'm a, a scientist and he has a question and he says, I have a problem, what should I do about it? And, and I say to him, well, look, based on what I know right now, you should do X for some value of X. And so Shalkat goes away and says, thank you very much. And he goes off and then 10 years later, he comes back and he says, look, I'm still having a problem. Uh, you know, what should I do? Uh, you know, I tried to follow your advice. And, and I might say to him, well, I've had 10 years to do additional research on this problem, and now you should do Y 
instead of X based on this knowledge I've accumulated. Now, Schalke could have one of two reactions. One reaction would be, oh, thank you for the additional 10 years of advice now that now I'll do, it, I'll do Y based on your uh, additional 10 years of work. Or he could say, so you lied to me 10 years ago when you told me to do X, so I don't believe Y either. Now, here's the problem with this anecdote. Science is exactly the, the, uh, the best approximation we have to how the world works right now, but it's not absolute. We keep discovering that our theories don't always match what our measurements tell us. And if we're good scientists, we accept that our theories are wrong and we have to amend the theory to match the data. But there are a lot of people who are very uncomfortable with that. They want to think of science as absolute, you know, this is the truth, there is no question about it. And then, you know, 10 years later, when the scientist says, you know what, I was wrong. And they say, well, then I don't believe any science at all because, you know, you're not, uh, you're, you're, you're flip-flopping. And the scientist isn't flip-flopping. The scientist is actually doing what science tells us to do. But there are a lot of humans who find that extremely uncomfortable. They want absolute truth. And I'm sorry, but science can't supply that. All it can do is the best approximation at the moment. I think you're spot on with that analogy. Thank you very much for that. Thank you, Mind. Um, do you still have a little bit more time? for? A no, I really do need to get going. I have another oh. event to, uh, to, to prepare for. So if, if you uh, don't mind, okay. I'll have to call, uh, call an end to this one. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Winton, for the wonderful discussion. You have set our minds thinking about new reality that we can see unfolding in healthcare. Uh, thank you also to our technology leaders in the panel and our audience for being with us uh, for your contributions. So thank you very much. Uh, on behalf of Al Khan University, Wint, I would like to thank you for your time. And it was a real prayer to host this one. And thank you, everyone, all the audience uh, for joining us. Thank you and have a very nice day. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you, Winton. Bye.